Hello, and welcome to the Drum History Podcast. I am Bart Vanderzee, and I am joined today by Jazz Sawyer. He is a drummer and educator out of L.A., and uh, really glad to have him here. Jazz, how are you, man? Bart, fantastic. I uh, really appreciate the show, and um, happy to be here today. Awesome, man. I really appreciate that. Um, today's topic is something that's really cool, and it's just sort of a broad, all-encompassing topic that I think we we need to talk about. It is an essential thing to this podcast, to the world of drumming, and that is the history of the drum set, basically, as we know it today, um, kind of learning how we got to the point we're at here uh, right now. That's right. Yeah, man. So what got you interested in this? Give us give us a little bit of, uh, of your background, and then we can uh, hop into the actual history. Sure. I was uh, born and raised in San Francisco, California, uh, in the Haight-Ashbury district. So cool. for those of you that don't know, that is the... Uh, uh, Holy Ground of the Grateful Dead, Janis Joplin, amongst others. Um, so I grew up in that neighborhood, and there was a music store down the street from me, the Head Ashbury Music Store. And uh, a couple frequent folks there was uh, drummer, percussionist, educator John Santos, who was a real instrumental, um, you know, helping me to explore percussion before I kind of knew what it was. So my mom would take me down there and I'd just uh, hang out and play uh, the drums, you know, but I, I didn't like the loud part of drums. I sure. just liked the rhythm of it, yeah. you know. Um, and, yeah, so my parents were hippies during that time, so, I, you know, people were named Sky and Jade and this <laughs> type of thing, so that's <laughs> that's actually my real name. Man, J-A-V, that's awesome. If, if you can believe that. Serendipitous. And it's all a coincidence. Exactly. It's all a coincidence that I would end up, you know, studying jazz drumming and, and performing. Wow. Um, but really, I, I started taking lessons there at the, at the music store. Uh, and my parents would take me to, you know, festivals. And the, San Francisco is really rich in the Bay Area in general for, you know, street festivals, performers, you know, all year round, um, you know, uh, community centers. So I, I was always interested in music. Didn't have any musicians in my family, just a, a big appreciation for it. And really what I got into drumming was I just basically started playing to Stevie Wonder records. Cool. <laughs> you know, yeah. uh, on the tape, I go to the music store, get some tapes and kind of just play for fun naturally. And uh, when I got into middle school, this is when uh, music programs were actually strong and had resources. Um, and I learned, you know, percussion, but I also like the drum set. So what really hit me, man, is when I got a tape from my dad in, uh, I believe it was seventh grade of Art Blakey, 1958 live in Paris. Wow. Yeah. And, and, and that messed me up for a few reasons. <laughs> One, it was, it was the drummer's record. Okay. Yeah. Number two, he's the band leader. Yeah. Totally. <laughs> okay? And then number three, his play. You know, so that just blew me away. That I was sold after that. Um, and just to move things along in high school is really where it came together. I really started diving into um, records and just listening to how they were put together. Um, you know, the, the heads, the, the beginnings, the endings, the setups, how to, how to accompany. But I was also studying, you know, concert percussion, snare drum, suspended cymbal, what have you. Uh, and then from there, I entered the San Francisco Conservatory prep department. And that's just kind of introduces you to solfege. And uh, from there, I would study a little deeper classical percussion, um, timpani, mallets, and so on. But also I had, I went to School of the Arts High School in San Francisco. So from there, I had buddies that were actually playing in the clubs and doing things, in particular, playing with a lot of the Cuban musicians. So <laughs> by 15, I actually, you know, studied uh, congas and timbales, and I was playing in the clubs when I wasn't supposed to <laughs> on Friday <laughs> yeah. and Saturday night. Wow. Making a little bread. And, and there's a joke. Um, I actually tried to paint uh, a mustache on me one time. just To, <laughs> to get into the club. Say, hey, this guy. Yeah, to get in the club. And it, it just looked ridiculous. But wow, that's awesome. In any in any event, I just wouldn't wear a hat. Just you know, <laughs> yeah, uh, keep out of the way. Older people so wear I hats. Play, you know, 
Exactly. So I would play salsa gigs on the weekends, but I would uh, all day Saturday I'd take solfege at the conservatory. So ultimately this would um, bring me to further my studies. I ended up uh, joining the 1996 Grammy Jazz Band with a few other folks. So that was a national band. I beat out all the drummers in the land. Nice. Um, not, I mean, I, I felt privileged to to be in that band. So we got to go to the Grammys and, you know, get to hang out with Quincy Jones <laughs> the cool. whole night. Wow. So, yeah, all of that helped me get to the new school in New York. Um, and that's where I really got to study with some of the masters uh, the music and really learn. So by that time, uh, by 19, uh, I was playing with Whit Marsalis, uh, touring the ro- road. Uh, at 20, I was became Addie Lincoln's drummer, great vocalist, master, uh, National Endowment of the Arts jazz master. Uh, she, for those of you who don't know, was married to Max Roach. Oh, wow. I didn't know that. And that's where we get the Freedom Now suite. So... It, during in high school as well, I got to see both Buddy Rich and Max Roach, uh, amongst others, perform. You know, when I was early, wow. so I would end up seeing Max Roach uh, a few years later in Brazil when he was still playing. Uh, it was kind of when he was slowing down um, and he wasn't walking too good, and, and I got to hang out with him a little bit. And he said, uh, "Give me your legs." <laughs> <laughs> It's like, let me borrow your legs, you know? Oh, man. Um, yeah, but I got to exchange some stories and really got a, a lot of knowledge. That's so just awesome. fast forward, um, I've always been curious about New Orleans. So right around my first or second year in New York, I, I decided to kind of make a pilgrimage to New Orleans. Um, it's kind of where my name came from, right? Yeah. Uh, so that led me to diving into the history of the drum set okay and that's yeah, kind yeah, of yeah. where we are today so yeah we got that out the way so no, that's man. kind of where I, uh, I i came in to the fold if you will no that's perfect i uh I, I deem you the right man to talk to about this topic from your background. <laughs> now it's okay, it's good to know people's backgrounds and everything that brings them to this point um what we're here to talk about today history of the drum set why don't we just kick it off and um and you can you can start it off, man. Okay, great. There's when we talk about drumming, we have to acknowledge the African diaspora. The African diaspora, if if we know anything about our history as human beings, we all started out in Africa and would flourish around the world. So that's number one. But there's three important things that come out of the African diaspora. And again, the African diaspora uh, encompasses uh, the people, the the culture, uh, every the food, everything that comes with uh, developing a community, a village. Okay, so that's the African diaspora. But there's three important things: music elements, not just for drumming, but we would not be where we are today without these three elements. Okay. First one: call and response. Call and response. Right. Yep. You you make a call. Okay. Pretty self-explanatory, right? Yeah. The second, syncopation. Now, as we define in Western music, it's uh, accents on the weak beat is the easy way to say it, but it's really that, um, you know, no rhythm or beat is unturned, right? Mm. There's a purpose for, for all of that. Yeah. Okay, and the third thing is improvisation. Where we get that improvisation is, for example, when a djembe drummer is following... Uh, the dancer, right? And and that could be for ceremony, it could be for celebration, it could be for a number of different things. But that improvisation, right? That movement, that that ongoing rhythm. Yeah. So those are three important elements that we we wouldn't have today in music, if if uh, or, or they still exist in music today. So yeah. that's what we get from the African diaspora. Um, so that's first and foremost. Um, another important element we have to understand or acknowledge is the uh, transatlantic slave trade. Now, obviously, we know um, you know Africans were uh, exported to different countries, um, and that's just kind of a part of our history that you know we want to acknowledge. Yeah. But what came with that is we uh, people. You know, it wasn't all bad in the sense that uh, 
we all, you know, exchanged cultures, sure. um, traded commodities, uh, things of that nature. So you had um, South America, you had the Caribbean, and you had Europe. Okay. Um, so with that, and, and I'm going to circle this back together between the uh, Latin countries, right, um, and the Yoruba tribe of Nigeria, they would uh, evolve in Cuba as well. Really? And this is where we have the merge, we have the development of the Latin tinge, okay? So the, the Latin tinge is a phenomenon that is, it's, yes, it's born out of the African diaspora, but it's its own flavor, it's its own, it's its own spice, it's its own soul. Right. Yeah. And what we get out of the Latin tinge is the clave. Yeah. Okay. The clave, as we know in Spanish, means key. So you know we can't really define, you know, African between Latin tinge. It's just they're they're both um, separate, but they're also both connected as well. Hmm. Okay. So where would we be without the Latin tinge and the clave pattern? Okay. The the basic three two clave pattern, right? Yep. Is, Shave and a haircut, five cents, right? Bum, 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 bum. Let's back up a little bit. So the concert snare drum um, kind of developed around uh, the 1500s, give or so. But really? the first rudiment, the first rudiment was recorded in 1612 in Basel, Switzerland. Oh my God! This is okay. Just, so for wow. Yeah, so for those that don't know, the Swiss were actually the first to kind of formalize rudimentary drumming, rudimental drumming, as we know it in the Western world. Um, cool. Okay, so now let's, we have, uh, don't forget, we have our classical music orchestra, so you start to get the appearance of concert snare drums or, or concert bass drums. And again, bass drums are just, uh, reflections of kind of indigenous cultures, right? Drums were used in uh, for different purposes. You had a mother drum, which was usually the bigger drum that kind of made the, the calls or everything started and ended with the mother drum. You had the middle drum, the segundo, right? That kind of held that middle part mm -hmm. or played their, their role. And then you had the quinto or the high drum, yeah. which would kind of do more of that call and response and do more of the talking and communicating. Yeah. Right? So... Drumming has its has had traditionally had its purpose. Um, so there's there's the different size and a different role. So fundamentally, since the beginning, there has been let's simplify it. There has been a low drum, the mother drum, the bass drum. Then there is the higher drum doing more of the uh, the talking and the accenting and and all the the quote unquote fancier stuff. So that is so true today. But it's just really cool to hear that it's been. I mean, it's kind of obvious, but that's basically always been there it's kind of that inherent human nature to have that low note and the higher note and then the middle notes obviously the the tone but um it's just built into us man exactly and you can you can see that with um brazilian drumming the surdos right the big the big bass drums and then you have the repiniques which are the the small little guys yeah the snareless kind of snare drums yeah it kind of drive the force so yeah drumming it, it's traditionally has its each different roles, right? Yeah. Um, so again, we have to understand too, with uh, going back to the transatlantic slave trade, uh, what you have to understand, we also had a, a, a first version of uh, YouTube, if you will, mm. in terms of the different people that were landing in these different parts. So, you know, you had Irishmen, you had Englishmen uh, landing in the Caribbean, right? So you got to imagine that scene. And believe it or not, at that time, there were, you know, peasants or street performers, you know, playing at the docks because you'd have mandolins, you'd have, uh, you know, funky kind of flutes and things like yeah. that going on. So yeah. you'd actually have street peddlers kind of, you know, doing a little duo or trio, uh, you know, kind of jamming because there wasn't really any formalized, uh, you know, that's why street music is kind of its own entity. Um but percussion and drumming, again, it was more used at a tr as a traditional ceremonial purpose or for like a marching, like a formal type of sure. situation. Sure, march to this beat. But it know? wasn't. Yeah. Exactly. But it wasn't necessarily a performance situation, right? Yeah. Now, with all that being said, there's one place in particular 
that was a international port. So not New York, right? Uh, not so much the East Coast. I mean, yes, we had the Boston Tea Party, right? We had uh, goods coming in. We had sugar, molasses, this type of thing. But New Orleans, Louisiana, the melting pot. Yeah. So whereas if we look at the East Coast, right, we had, uh, you know, pretty much Africans were distributed, you know, sent to the South, and it, it was pretty straight ahead where they were sent. You know, it, mm-hmm. there wasn't um, that freedom, and, and especially with uh, other immigrants and people coming in, you know, they they were able to find odd jobs, but they kind of were recluded, if you will, yeah. or what's the word I'm looking at? Yeah, to, to farms, and they kind of had to build their own uh, village and, and kind of settle in uh, wherever they were at. Yeah. But in particular, New Orleans... This was a melting pot where you had people from all over the world that would end up on the same block in the same neighborhood. So in the same neighborhood, you might have, you know, a Chinese family. You might have an Irish family. You might have a Native American family. You might even have an African family. Hmm. And what comes with that is their culture, their food, their instruments, their rhythms. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so you have to paint the pictures of of America and these different influences. Uh, Because if you look at just African drumming and drums at their core, um, you know, certain types of cowbells, uh, you know, the djembe drum, and then you look at, uh, you know, symbols like the Turkish symbols, right? That's where we get symbols from. I'll, I'll get into that. The China, the Chinese Tom Tom. I mean, it's just uh, exactly, yes. exactly. And so this is this is kind of where we're at. So we're in, but there's one thing that happens in New Orleans um, that's that's very important. So uh, obviously we have the Emancipation Proclamation um, in the 1860s that passes by Abraham Lincoln, which is abolished slavery. Um, obviously, that took some time to get past that. But in New Orleans, there was a place called Congo Square. Congo Square, which is known as Louis Armstrong Park today, this is where on Sundays, slaves were able to uh, have a day of ceremony, a day of rest, if you will. So this would be a a square in the park. uh, And not not everybody was enslaved, but not everybody was free. Gotcha. Most part for the folks that lived on the plantations or whatnot. This was Congo Square, and they were able to practice uh, their African rhythms, their uh, traditions, sing. So let me paint the picture for you. On a Sunday, you could go to this park on Congo Square, and you might have aristocrats there. You'd have peasants there, right? You'd have high society folks there standing around watching this, um, you know, celebration. Wow. So they, 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 they had, you know, limited drums and whatnot, but imagine, um, you know, you're an Irish, an Irishman or a woman, or you're, uh, you know, a, a French composer coming in yeah, <laughs> and yeah. you're hearing all this yeah, stuff. Your world is opening right? up, man. Yeah. Your world, world is opening up. Okay. So now we do have, uh, military bands. We have marching bands in New Orleans, mm-hmm. right? And that's no secret. So what do we have that we have concert bass drums, we have concert snare drums, crash cymbals. We also have uh, Asian uh, percussion, which the, the small toms that we see on those first drum sets. Yeah, little red right? tom, yeah. Exactly. So we have all of these. We have little cowbells. We have cymbals. We have all these kind of various percussions. Let's, and let's, let's clarify right now, they're all separate. Most of these things are not really put together in one cohesive... It's not one guy sitting there playing a what we consider a drum set. These are all in, right. individual elements. Cool. Right. We have not gotten there. We do, these are all percussion instruments from various uh, cultures. Yeah. They, they, we don't have a set of drums yet. We're not there. Yeah. What we do have is we have a, a concert bass drum, you know, a, a marching bass drummer, and we do have a snare drum. Yes. And occasionally a, a crash cymbalist, sure. if you will. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so we don't have... We don't have this yet. And the reason is the music's not there yet. So let us look at the time Louis Armstrong was born in the late 1800s, early 1900s. We start to get in this time. What we have are these saloons, these 
brothel house. And the brothel houses, as we may or may not know, is where uh, gentlemen would go to uh, find the company of a lady. Sure. Yep. And they would have uh, uh, spent some time together. But how they uh, entertained or how they uh, kind of made this place the place to be is they had a piano player. Hmm. So Scott Joplin, uh, piano players, this is where we get the birth of like ragtime music. Yeah, very early Americana, kind of what you think of when you watch like an old, uh, uh, almost like a Ken Burns documentary about the Civil War or something like that, that kind of piano kind of sound. That's exactly it, because the piano players, right, it was a, a something that you could you know play, but you had this mix of kind of this marching band style, boom, chit, boom, chit, yep. boom, chit on the piano, right? Yeah. Uh, or kind of theatrical, kind of vaudeville sure. kind of playing. Sure, exactly. There's another important part in New Orleans that people may not be hip to. This is the Mardi Gras Indian. Huh. The Mardi Gras Indian, they kind of come into uh, development, if you will, in the early 1800s. Uh, and basically, the Mardi Gras Indian is a culture uh, really formed from Native Americans and African Americans. African, free African Americans and Native Americans, obviously, they, uh, because of their his- history, they had a lot of commonalities. And those were cultures that were there that came together and, again, really shared uh, the experiences and and so what comes out of that is the Mardi Gras Indian is another type of street beat. So uh, just like you have your clave, right? You have your bump, bump, bump. But this is a, a rhythm that just continues. Bump, 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 bump. Kind of like a Native American uh, kind of bass drum. Yeah, 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 yeah. Boom, 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 boom. Yeah, it's, exactly. It's, it's a little more syncopat, uh, syn- Syncopized, if you will. <laughs> More I will. Syncopated. Yeah. yeah. Uh, syncopize it. Syncopize it. So you have a syncopated African beat with a Native American type of drumming. Man, what, but wow. what you have is a, 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 a new neighborhood. So those are also the rhythms that are happening in New Orleans at that time. And, and um, that's where we get kind of the celebration of Mardi Gras is the Mardi Gras Indians. Uh, they're a chief, and they have uh, kind of different disciples and, and people in their crew that, you know, in their community. And really, back in the day, it was a battle for the neighborhood, right? So yeah. it would get a little, there would be some bloodshed, but eventually it become more more of a competitive type of thing. Like my, I'm going to make my um, my outfits going to be better than yours. And what they do is they sew all year round, you know, to make these elaborate costumes with beads. But you have to understand with that they're actually writing songs they're singing they're playing rhythms they're they're stomping things out and the, this is like goes goes back to the african diaspora call and response uh improvisation syncopation yeah they're establishing their own voice and their own identity which allows them to kind of you know uh be distinct from each other sure. so you have this you have congo square you have the marching band we also get the emergence of the brass band. So the brass band is like a street, is a condensed marching band, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. With, a, with fewer musicians that are improvising off of these kind of marching type of cadences, but they're using a little more of the blues. I was going to say, all right, pause for one second. I have two questions for you. Mardi Gras Indian. Sure clarify that a little bit so mardi gras indian is that the name of a a rhythm a group of people is it actually a native american tribe mardi gras indian like uh navajo indian or is it clear that up just a little bit yes the mardi gras indian is unique to new orleans louisiana because it was really that uh merge of african-american and native american culture that shared and and uh, developed into something new. So the Mardi Gras Indian is just its own. It's a, it's a people of New Orleans, like a culture. So gotcha. It's not. It's a it's a culture exactly. It's a culture, and out of that, um, they establish tribes. Okay. You know, they're kind of like uh, honorary tribes in the neighborhood. So, for example, um, you have the Treme. Uh, yeah. So Donald Harrison, great saxophonist, he's big chief Donald Harrison. 
Man, that's okay, awesome. Who, who also play with Art Blakey. Yeah, and then so you have these big chiefs, and that's what they're called. Wow. Um, also, Christian Scott, uh, who's his nephew, he's actually a big chief now. And so when you're a chief, you have the responsibility to kind of uh, oversee the neighborhood. Um, and, and that's, again, the Mardi Gras Indian is a New Orleans unique culture. That cool. is a very much part of New Orleans, just like beignets and gumbo and brass bands. So you can't <laughs> yeah. have New Orleans without the Mardi Gras Indian. Cool. Okay. Thank you for explaining. Now, we are at brass band. Before you continue, I want to ask you, now, is the brass band, because we have our Mardi Gras Indian, we have these different categories, would the brass band, who's putting these, these together? Like, is this some sort of an official, like, it's not a military band, who, how do they get together? And then you can carry on. But I'm just curious about that. Like, who's organizing the brass band? That is an excellent question. It, it's all kind of simultaneously happening at the same time. Gotcha. So, again, you have Congo Square. You have the emergence of this type of uh, piano, type of ragtime music. And, again, mm-hmm. that's, that's a generic name. But yeah. you have piano players actually kind of experimenting with um, you know, traditional or, or what they're hearing from the South, the blues with the classical technique, with the kind of marching band, you know, to keep things rolling. Uh, so yeah, the brat, no one's really organizing these small street brass bands, but you have uh, young musicians picking up the instrument, learning from watching. So these Got big it. military bands would come through town and, and whatnot, but maybe a few of them stray off. Right. Yeah, and and yeah. maybe the ba- and, and so what we get from the snare drummers and the bass drummers is you have boom tick boom tick boom tick boom tick boom tick you know you kind of have this straight military beat. But what happens now? Here's the kicker. This is what makes New Orleans drumming and and really a big contribution to music. It's called the Big Four. The Big Four is what now we get brass band. Ragtime, jazz, Dixieland. This is where music changes in American music forever. So the yeah. big four. So we have our boom, tick, boom, tick, boom, tick, boom, tick, right? Yep. Now we're going to accent beat four on the bass drum. One, two, one, two, three, four. Two, one, two, three, four. So kind of every other bar, we accent that beat four. And what it does is it puts in a syncopated breath it puts a jump in it. It puts a jolt in the rhythm. So we're not playing, we're not playing in the lines. Boom, tick, boom, tick. We're doing something funkier. Boom, tick, boom, tick, boom, tick, boom, 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 boom. Yeah. Boom, yeah, yeah, yeah. Boom, it's more boom, interesting. Boom. And now that, and now the snare drum is not just playing eights and sixteenth notes. They're playing a little more syncopated. So instead of, jack, 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 you know, a bunch of slams, right? Blah, yep. blah, 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 blah. Now they're going, Jack it, they got it, jack it, jack it, jack it, jack it, and they're using that Latin tinge clave. Jack it, jack it, jack it, jack it, jack, jack, and everything that's going on in New Orleans at that time, and the Irish jigs, you know, the guitars, um, the uh, Asian collectives that are doing their performances, right? Yeah. So there's all these rhythms going on. So the the, the brass band, uh, you know, to your point, they didn't really organize per se, uh, they're just kind of forming. It's just jamming. As, you yeah, know, you're getting together and you're playing. That's That makes perfect sense. Yeah, exactly. Because the military bands, you know, they're huge and, and not everybody's, you know, in the Army yeah. necessarily For, signed up. Definitely. So they're just, they kind of, you know, and that's where you get the formal outfits, right? They want to, you know, uh, still have that dignity, um, uh, but they're not necessarily part of any... Uh, you know, country or, or regiment, if you will. They just started their own bands. But really, those are the folks that start to come jam with the piano player. Hmm. So now we start to get a combo. We start to get a combination of uh, piano players and trumpet players. And, and this is where the after hours, the jam session comes up. Yeah. Well, hey, what about the drummers? The drummers got to get in on some of that. So, but the dr- there weren't any drummers. So you had these concert bass drums. Uh, you had these snare drums. There weren't any snare drum stands, okay? And, and, you know, we, we, we have Ludwig that, that comes in the picture, um, and not until 1909 with the first bass drum pedal. Yeah. But before that, we have, um, okay, well, look, we now we have our piano player, we have our, uh, you know, our horn player, and so we don't want to do the brass band thing because that's something that's played in the street and it's a little more 
party centric. Yeah. We actually want to put, you know, a combination because I'm a violinist. I'm classically trained. Uh, I'm a trumpet player. I have the same thing. I, I know how to play trumpet, read music. So again, kind of organically and by default, you had these people starting combinations. Hmm. So as these combos started uh, with a, a stand-up bass or a tuba, a violin, the percussion started to become, have, have a seat at the table, if you will. It's a natural progression. Right. So Exactly. So now when we're bringing the drum set or percussion inside, right, there's not any really formal setup. So we have a concert bass drum. That's why when you look at all these early uh, pictures, there's like 26-inch bass drums. They're all marching bass <laughs> yeah. drums. With no feet. Okay. Yeah. No feet. So we, we, we put the bass drum there on the ground. That's kind of like, okay, this is where our area is. Uh, some of the first snare drums were put on chairs. Yeah, exactly. There weren't any, you know, they, they were, if there was any concert snare drum uh, hardware, it was for concert, so you couldn't play it standing up. This is the double drumming at, at the entrance of yeah, the double drumming. Yeah, this is where double drumming comes in. So now we have two drums, right? We have a, we have a concert bass drum and a snare drum. Well, how do we play the bass drum, Bart? I, you know, I, we obviously know where it's going to go, but, but how did they do that early on? Would they just kick it? Would they hit it with a stick with one hand? I mean, what happened? Exactly. So, um, baby Dodds, who was one of the original drummers, and yes. he's on the iconic, uh, Louis Armstrong photos and whatnot, but you would play the bass drum with the stick mm, interesting. with your right hand. So you would, you do a boom, chick, boom, chick type of thing, but your bass drum you would be playing with a stick, okay? Yeah. And then, and from the double drumming, from your snare drum, bass drum, guess what? Well, a lot of folks uh, like the sound of the Asian tom. Right? It wasn't a tom, I'm, I'm, uh, forgive me, I don't know the actual name, but those kind of small drums sure. served as toms because they, you know, they were great for ensemble playing, they weren't too loud, they had a great tone, um, and that's where we kind of get the tom-tom uh, type of situation where now I have another tone. So yeah. now I'm beyond double drumming, right? I have a snare drum, I got my bass drum, and now I'm putting bells and, uh, you know, adding cymbals and blocks and, 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 and add yeah. little things to that. Right. So I don't really have a set of drums yet. I have a contraption. A trap kit, yeah. Right. I have a double, double drums, and I have all these other stuff, so I have a contraption. And a lot of people... May or may not know, right? That's why, hey, do you play traps? Traps come is the abbreviation of contraption. Yes. So we also have to understand that, uh, okay, so now we have this kind of uh, presented music. So we got this ragtime music, which is not necessarily, it's syncopated in a more performance type of thing. So, for example, now that the, the contraption is set up, we're playing with the bass drum, we're playing with the snare drum, but we're finding new ways and techniques to like play a bridge section or an intro. And what that comes with is playing on the rim, you know, playing with, uh, you know, trying different things out, riding the cymbal, right? It's trying to, uh, you know, choking the cymbal, trying to come up with different ways to do that. Yeah. Um, and then obviously there's something called the low boy. Now the low boy was uh, a concoction of, basically two small crash cymbals right with with a foot pedal so it, it you would think you'd have the the bass drum pedal before a low boy uh and that's what it was called a low boy yeah, right yeah. which was basically two crash cymbals in a, in a pedal contraption that or uh figure that kind of made those chop and that was a way to keep time yeah, and then people should uh, people should look that up too because low boys or sock symbols or I think sometimes called the Charleston symbol, that in itself, which we'll do an episode on, is just fascinating to see the the development of that. I mean, it's just and you're you're nailing it, man. You're hitting hitting it right on the head with how it's it's crazy. It was before the bass drum pedal. It's also it, we're getting there. We're we're getting to it's right. just naturally happening. Exactly, and you know now we we know Gretsch. Right, he in Williamsburg, and and those guys are starting to, you know, um, kind of hear what's going down in New Orleans. But don't forget, in New York at that time, you know, there was Ten Pen Alley. We had the kind of birth of uh, Broadway, and this kind of live vaudeville, right? And yeah. this is where the percussion pit type 
you know, kind of comes in there. So there was a market. And guess what else happens there? The Industrial Revolution, mm-hmm. right? So we start to get automobiles. We start to get manufacturing. And so this is where Gretsch and, and Ludwig and, and, you know, Ford, and, uh, you know, Chase and, yeah. <laughs> right, Carnegie, all these guys start, uh, you know, developing things to, to create industry. And this is where we start to get that hardware. Yeah. Uh, and and start to get the set of drums. So so the double drumming essentially, you know, becomes more uh, common. And so this is why you have Louis Armstrong, you know, the Hot Five, and everybody has their uh, their names. But really, how it got out of there is they would take these combos on the steamboats. Another innovation at the time, they would go to Chicago and Kansas City and wow. go up to New York. You're going on the road. Right? Well, so, not a, yeah, on the right, river. So Gretsch. <laughs> Right, we know Gretsch, uh, listening to, you know, your other wonderful episode with your guest there, Gretsch, yes, they did have the, uh, you know, the company and they were ready to go, but now with with the uh, introduction of the uh, contraption or the set of drums, now we can actually uh, do something to evolve it. And here's one more very important tidbit that changes everything. So Papa Joe Jones one of our favorites, yep, right? Yep, yep. Started playing a good, his friend, Count William Count Basie, right, um, of Kansas City, and he started very young with him, I think 12 or 14, and he grew up in this time where now the drum set uh, was actually a little more formalized, but this may or may not be true, but this changes everything. Papa Joe Jones had a friend that was a plumber. Okay, you with me, Bart? Yeah, I'm with you, plumber. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now we have a low boy, and he w- he asked his friend to maybe experiment with how can we raise this low boy up. Really? So I could you know maybe do some more things with it. Yeah. And so he built him a prototype, and this is kind of where we get the name hi hat because we have raised it from the low boy, and and my assumption again is it, it, it's you know the. The hi hat is kind of shaped like a hat, yeah, exactly, you know, or a brim, if you will. Yeah, but we've raised it up, so the hi hat is still the sock symbol, right? But it, it, the the historical name is the sock symbol, but it's because it came, you know, from that. But it's the hi hat now. Yeah, wow. but from the hi hat, we get now a way for drummers to keep time. And Chick Webb, William Chick Webb, in Harlem, and the Cotton Club would push this along. Yeah, yeah. Right, along with Sonny Greer and Duke Ellington. Yeah. They the, the hi hat changed everything. But guess what, Bart? If we didn't have the hi hat, we couldn't get into rock and roll. We couldn't get into funk. We couldn't get anywhere where we are today. So uh, each generation and, uh, you know, uh, period kind of introduces a new innovation or something that moves something along. So it's just kind of by coincidence that. We have this formation of the double drumming in New Orleans in particular because of these combinations. These groups would go up and down, uh, you know, the coast. They'd go and travel. Then in, when New York gets a hold of it, Gretsch, guess what? Gretsch has a whole, you know, now we can start manufacturing sets of drums or drum set. Yeah, because we see it. And, and honestly, everything you're saying, so... I think it's cool to, to, to look at the forms, the tools that drummers would use as the timekeeping instrument, meaning that um, we think of it now as your right hand on the hi-hat or on the ride. But back then, the snare would be the timekeeping. You'd keep a steady rhythm on the snare, and then that would develop more into uh, doing it on the ride. Like, we man, we take these things for granted. We think it's just automatic, but that's what I love about... Joe Jones, Papa Joe Jones and uh, Gene Krupa is, I think that there's the debate about like Gene Krupa or Buddy Rich, and I always talk about Gene, but Gene Krupa or Buddy Rich, sure. Buddy, Buddy's obviously a monster, but it was a different time where uh, you're pulling this stuff out of thin air. You're just inventing it because you saw someone play it on a steamboat coming on tour from New Orleans and you see their sock symbol and you say, man, what if we raise that up? Joe Jones gets a plumber friend to help. I mean... Man, it is just the, it's the advent of the drum set. This is how it all came together. Exactly. It's so cool. And, and, 
and just to break that myth, Bart, uh, Gene Krupa, Buddy Rich, I mean, all of these guys were fascinated with each other. Uh, yeah, they you're right. They studied each other. There's no battle. And and then, and just to put this out there, this could be a whole other topic, Louis Belt. Yep. A lot of people don't know the double bass drum, the double exactly. pedal. Exactly, yeah. That came from him being inspired by everyone else, and his dad was a... Um, uh, worked on cars and things like that. Oh, cool. So he like asked a, yeah. his dad to build him a prototype of two bass drums. Wow. Or, you know, putting a, a set together like that. And that takes it to a whole nother thing. So uh, where we have it today, the drum set is still evolving because now you see people using, you know, three or four snare drums. Yeah. Or three three bass drums. Yeah. Right? So the possibilities for drumming are endless as it's, you know, only over 100 years old. But it's very important to know that without the development of the drum set, we would not have any of the music today. Uh, again, the African diaspora, the three important elements, syncopation, call and response, improvisation, it's something that's used in music today. And, uh, you know, I, I, I implore everyone, uh, all the listeners and that, that listen to this great show, to just dig in a little more and into those periods. Check out a brass band. Right. Check out the Mardi Gras Indian. Check out the early uh, Jelly Roll Morton and Louis Armstrong recordings and hear what that was like. And then from there, you check out Chick Webb, Gene Krupa, who brings in soloing and phrasing into drumming. Right. Le- making that the drum set a leader. Yeah. The Gene Krupa big band. Yeah. OK. You, you, you're turning drummers. And so I, I just want all our drummers to know out there, you can be respected as a musician and a band leader just as anyone else. That's very true. I just want to say, too, you're talking about the different drum sets, and I just love how Joe Jones, Papa Joe Jones, not to be confused with Philly Joe Jones, but Papa Joe Jones with the floor right. tom to his left. I mean, that's just like, right now you think, oh, whatever, you just move your floor tom, you have fun you, no, you experimenting. Think, you think Dennis Chambers. Or you think Dennis Chambers. Uh, you, think, you think, yeah. Yeah, right. Looking at the African diaspora where he's the improvisational style, thinking about where that came from and just jazz in general is just bouncing off each other and just – and then syncopating. And, and again, you you don't think about the elements that make these things what they are. Um, so when you go back and listen to Gene playing – Gene Krupa playing Sing, Sing, Sing and that revolutionary uh, floor tom riff, that's not – that was not like just a, that was a big deal. That was not heard before. Now we kind of take it for granted, but this is, it was a special thing. I mean, to, to play your bass drum with your right hand, because you didn't have, Ludwig hadn't invented the bass drum pedal yet, which I'm sure that's up for debate on who actually invented it. Or as far as I know, Leedy sure. inventing the snare stand. It's like, it was a right. chair. It was a chair before that. <laughs> like we're, literally a chair. Yeah, a chair, man. And and a suitcase double, playing on double that. Double drumming. Double yeah. drumming. Yeah. <laughs> man, that's uh Jazz, you you really know your stuff, man. And I I'm in, I am excited to go research the Mardi Gras Indian um brass bands, look up all this stuff and and I always post old pictures and videos and stuff and it's just neat to to hear more and it's it's it is endless. Fantastic. Well, I, I, as you can tell, I get excited talking about this stuff and, and, and any period or any drummer or uh, innovation, you can go and, and really just dig into it. It's just fascinating to me because uh, yeah. it, it's, it's just fun. I mean, we love the history of the drum. Absolutely. You know, we, it is an essential episode to understand everything else that we talk about on this show revolves around this topic. It We wouldn't have anything without going back to Africa and the Latin rhythms and everything. So I can't thank you enough for, for filling us in on what it's all about and, and the whole, you know, putting it all into perspective. Great. Bart. Well, I really appreciate, appreciate you having me on the show and uh, I'm a big fan and uh, I will continue to listen on and uh, uh, all the drummers, you can do anything you want to do. So uh, don't, don't be intimidated by, uh, people that say you're not musicians absolutely anyone who says that uh they're not my friend (laughs) okay well maybe they'll still be my friend but i'm not i'm not happy with them but uh i want to tell everyone they can 
you can keep up with Jazz. Find his website. It's J A Z S A W Y E R dot com, jazzsawyer.com. And from there, you can link to his Facebook and see what he's up to and hear his music and, and everything cool. And I'm sure Jazz would want to, I'm sure you would want to talk to anyone who has, who's interested in this topic and uh, people can reach out and they can tell you what they think about, you know, the history of drums and we can get the, the conversation started. Wonderful. Yeah, I'll send out any references or recommendations for any of you guys. So, again, appreciate it. Awesome. All right, Jazz, we'll keep it up, man. And uh, thank you so much for talking with us today. Drummers rule the world. If you like this podcast, find me on social media at Drum History and please share, rate, and leave a review. And let me know topics that you would like to learn about in the future. Until next time, keep on learning. This is a Gwyn Sound Podcast.